Hi, my name is Nick, and welcome to Nick's Picks, the YouTube channel where we look at watches that I would pick, I might pick, or I have picked. And today we're going to be looking at a watch that, surprise, I've picked! I've picked pretty much every watch that we've seen so far. And uh, this week is no exception. We'll be looking at the Breitling Navitimer 8 Automatic 41. The Breitling Navitimer that isn't really going to live up to its name at all and isn't really a Navitimer at all anymore. Uh, it came out in 2018, shortly after George Kern took over as Breitling CEO, coming over from IWC. And uh, it's an interesting take on a vintage-inspired design. It was actually inspired by the Breitling uh, Reference 768, uh, really only seen in the symmetry of the dial. Now, this is a much more elegant, classy, thin, uh, understated piece from Breitling. Uh, if we look at the Navitimer line, you typically see that these are tool watches for uh, aviating, and you see these slide rules in the bezel and really high complication from that perspective. But really, if you look at the the movements behind it, well, actually, you'll still find complication there because we have chronographs uh, that are uh, quite powerful and quite beautiful. Uh, however, this is a huge departure. It's a Navitimer in name only that's not even a chronograph. It's, in fact, uh, time and date only, powered by an ETA 2824-2, or technically a Breitling 17, but more on that later. Uh, now, as we look at this watch, it is blue not a surprise either. In fact, that's what drew me to it. Uh, I saw it in the case at my local authorized dealer, and it was, you know, one of the only at the time, one of the only Breitlings that was not super flashy, uh, wasn't giant. In fact, you'll find that uh, it is very thin. Uh, that was another thing that drew me to it. It's just, it is super thin in terms of its case height. Uh, it's 10.7 millimeters. And I, I saw it, and every year for our anniversary, my wife and I, we, we do watches. And I told my wife, this has to be the anniversary watch for this year. And uh, I waited, and, and when we did finally pick it up, I actually bought it for myself for my anniversary. It still counted. Um, I had asked about it. I was like, so do you still have that Navitimer 8 in stock? And I was told, uh, you mean the Aviator 8? And I was like, no, no, the, the Navitimer 8 Automatic 41, that would be the one. And uh, no, do you mean the Aviator 8? And it turns out that what had happened with this watch is it so did not live up to its name that it was basically removed from the collection and moved into a different collection. It was moved into a new Aviator collection because it really didn't uh, play off the Navitimer heritage at all. Um, that being said, the Aviator is still a beautiful watch. Uh, I wouldn't personally buy the new Aviator because it does have... Uh, Fotina, I'm not really a fan of fake patina. Uh, it is going to have a little bit more splash of color, so it has some yellow in the, the indices where they're loomed. It has some red, uh, and it has some blue, obviously, in the white. So it's a little bit more different variety of colors than I was really interested in getting. I really like the simplistic, just blue and white uh, style of the Navitimer 8. And so that's the way I went, even though that at that point I bought it, the Aviator 8 was available. And I, I feel like that's a kind of a bonus now because it is a special watch in that respect. It's one that was not well loved under that name. In fact, some of the comments when it came out um, were not very positive if you look at some of the articles from that time frame. Uh, but I love it. I think it's a fantastic watch. I do wear it uh, fairly often. I do treat it as kind of one of more of those everyday watches, although uh, it does have that versatility to play any role that you might need it to play. All right, so let's go ahead and talk specifications. The Breitling Navitimer 8 Automatic 41 has a case size of 41 millimeters. That's kind of obvious given the name. Has a lug to lug of only 48 millimeters. So even though it has a larger case size, uh, the lug to lug makes it wear smaller than, for example, a Rolex Submariner. Its thickness also contributes to it wearing a little bit smaller at a 10.7 millimeter case thickness. Now, uh, as we look at that, you can see it very much could be worn as a dress watch. It has that classy look. It has the uh, high polish in the knurling of the bezel. Also has some high polish chamfered edges on the case. And yet it also maintains that everyday aesthetic with the brushed case side. So you get a little bit of both worlds in there of the everyday and the little dressy uh, touches there that allow it to have some versatility, especially with that thickness of 10.7 millimeters. Uh, material here is obviously stainless steel, as you can tell. And in terms of the movement, it is a Breitling 17 
which is really just a highly decorated ETA 2824-2. Because it's an ETA 2824-2, the rest of these stats aren't really going to be surprising, right? It's going to be a self-winding movement with a power reserve of 38 hours, a frequency of 28,800 vibrations per hour, and uh, that kind of rounds out the movement. Now, as far as the crystal, it is a sapphire crystal with dual AR coating, which means it has AR coating both on the uh, bottom of the crystal, the underside of the crystal, as well as the top of the crystal, which actually kind of threw me for a loop at first because the crystal actually looks invisible under certain lighting. But then under other lighting, you get this really harsh blue hue. And uh, if there's any kind of smudges or scratches on it, you will see it. So uh, just be aware of that. The case back is stainless steel, so no display case back on this, but of course, with an ETA 2824-2, I don't really need a display case back. And then finally, it has a water resistance of only 10 bar or 100 meters, which is surprising uh, given that it does have a screw-down crown. So it does feature a screw-down crown, but it does not feature uh, extensive water resistance there. Uh, one of the things not called out on the, the specifications is one of the complications that it features, which is this timing bezel. So it doesn't have the slide rule like you might see in a proper Navitimer, but it does still have this uh, integrated timing bezel, which is a bi-directional timing bezel, and it does stop very nicely at the 12. So as you kind of go around, I'm trying to do this one-handed here, but as you go around and you hit the 12, there's just a little bit more resistance there. So even if you're not looking, you can accidentally stop at the 12, but you can, uh, you know, it's bi-directional, so you can go both directions pretty easily, and, uh, you know, it works pretty nice. However, being able to see that, you know, being able to figure out where it is in terms of time is not as easy because it's not a loomed, it's not a really high contrast uh, arrow there. You don't have any um, other markings on the bezel to help indicate how much time has elapsed. And so while it is kind of nice to mark a reference time of when something started or, you know, some target time when something's going to happen, uh, it's not highly visible. Uh, so trying to be able to keep track of that might be a challenge. Now about the loom on this one, I think the loom is... Well, it, it looks really nice because you have all of the, the numerals loomed. You have the handset loom. They've actually applied very thick uh, loom to it. It looks very nicely applied. Uh, however, it doesn't last very long. It starts to fade really quickly. I also wish that the second hand was loomed. It is painted white, but it's not loomed like the hour and minute hand. And I think it's just a missed opportunity all around. I think it could be a lot brighter it looks incredible when it's actually first lighting up, but it just doesn't stay, right? There's no staying power. The initial brightness isn't that great, but it looks cool to be able to actually read the Arabic numerals in bright light in the middle of the dark. All right, so let's talk about the clasp. The clasp is a double retention milled clasp that uh, sadly doesn't really feature much adjustment. I mean, it has a few points of micro adjust, so you can uh, basically get the bracelet kind of to the right size, but in terms of, you know, the the growth of one's wrists throughout the day or things like that, that's not really going to be accounted for. So uh, hopefully you carry around a spring bar tool as an everyday implement. All right, so that about wraps it up. I mean, this is a watch I don't have a lot of bad things to say about. I really do like it. Uh, adjustability isn't great on the bracelet. In fact, uh, the size of the lugs not great either, right? 21 millimeter lug width. That is the most annoying lug width to try to find straps. Uh, needs to be 20. Really does. Um, but other than that, it's it's a very nice, versatile watch. A very unique pick in terms of the uh, the naming and, and the history around that. Uh, but definitely one that has that elegance to it. And uh, still has, you know, some backing in terms of brand names, right? We have the, the Breitling brand associated with that. Uh, not only famous for their history in aviation, but also their land and sea watches. And uh, they're one of the few uh, watchmakers that does submit all of their movements for independent testing. In this case, all of their movements are COSC certified. Uh, and so you get some degree of accuracy uh, guaranteed in multiple positions and in multiple conditions in terms of temperature. So that about wraps it up this week. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. And until next time, take care. If you like this episode, please be sure to subscribe to both this channel and the About Time channel, give this video a like, and hit that notification bell to be notified about future episodes. Hey, so um, the episode's over. You might have fallen asleep on the couch or something. That happens to me a lot. I fall asleep on the couch when I'm, I should be in bed. Um, 
So you should probably go to bed. If, if you actually did fall asleep, you should go to bed. It's healthier probably. Won't end up with that back pain. <sighs> that back pain really... The, you know, the sleeping on the couch back pain sucks. Uh, also, you need to wake up because if you don't wake up right now, YouTube is going to start auto-playing some really messed up, crazy nonsense. So, I mean, I guess that it, only if you're interested in that, um, would it probably play that? It would probably actually just play watch videos. All right, well, the end.